Good evening, welcome to Athens City Council. Tonight's Monday, June 14th of 2010. Uh, this evening, City Council is uh, meeting in a series of committee meetings. Uh, we're going a little bit out of order since uh, someone we need to speak to some items for our Finance Committee meeting is not there yet. So we're jumping to our Environmental Committee, Committee Chair, Alok Gosling. Thank you. Um, I have a couple items. Uh, on the agenda tonight, the first is natural hazard mitigation plan um, for the county. We have a guest here, um, Lori Burchett, and she's going to present a little bit of information on the update to the county uh, natural hazard mitigation plan. Um, this is it's a plan that is updated every few years. I think this is a five-year update. Um, basically, it's to reduce the risk and um, to property and life in the event of a natural disaster. Um, in, in Athens, Athens County, uh, or the region. Um, so with that, Lori, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and you have the floor. Great, thank you. My name is Lori Burchett and I'm with the Athens County Regional Planning Commission. And we are working up on um, the five-year update on our natural hazard mitigation plan that was adopted almost five years ago. <laughs> and um, the, when the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 was passed, it required that communities adopt a natural hazard mitigation plan to receive um, disaster funding. So it's important to do the required five-year update to continue to get funding in the event of a natural disaster. Um, there are five aspects that, are, that go into the natural hazard plan, and um, a hazard analysis is one of them. And we've um, put together a pie chart um, that shows the different hazards that are related to um, the city of Athens. And like most communities in Athens County, the number one hazard is um, flooding. So you can see that on the pie chart. <laughs> and um, the city of Athens is a little bit different than the other communities in that the next um, greatest Gosh, risk is of an ice storm and then flash flooding that follows that. And so, um, Step one is to do the hazard analysis, and this needs to be redone to identify certain hazards that may have done, happened in those past five years. And then the next um, portion of the plan is to do an asset identification. And this is done through the use of the auditor's data. And for the city of Athens, this is going to be um, probably the largest project um, in the city and villages that we're going to look at. And it's a large part of the project and it needs to include all of the structures of the city and um, so this the Regional Planning Commission is going to work on identifying all those structures so that we can do the third um, part of the plan is the loss estimation and that's to update um, what's currently in the plan and to um, you know get new structures that may have been built in the past five years onto the plan so that in the event of a disaster all the structures are accounted for um, and then we would also like to update our mitigation strategies. And I have several handouts. <laughs> um, and we do have a current um, mitigation plan um, strategies um, that are in place right now. And several of these have been accomplished by the city of Athens. And some of them may need um, continuing maintenance or continuing um, to work on the activity or task that it goes along with it. Um, and then others may need to be revisited. Um, maybe they're not feasible or something like that. So, um, and then the fifth um, part of the mitigation plan is outreach efforts. And that goes along with um, while we're doing the rest of the plan, just to have the continued community involvement in that. Um, so we're going around to all of the villages and having public meetings and trying to get as much um, information out there to the community members as possible so we can get as much input in the in the plan um, so that's kind of where what is, what's going on with the previous plan what's been done and where we are in the process is um, we have been looking at the data that we have for um, updating the structures list and also for the loss estimation um, and we've been meeting with the villages, and we have also um, compiled a public survey um, that we want to, we've tried to get as many people in the community um, involved in the public survey, and so I am going to pass it out to all of you <laughs> so that we can hopefully get some more um, responses to the survey. It's um, trying to gauge 
what has happened um, with community members in the event of a natural hazard. Thank you so much. Same thing. And then a, another aspect of the plan is to do a development and a trend analysis to look at what is going on with development, what's happened, what are the trends um, in the past five years, and how can this be updated. Um, and this can be good development, bad development, um, that sort of just anything that's happening and what kind of trends are going on with that. Um, the city of Athens has been particularly good at um, enforcing floodplain um, regulations. So we'd like to see that continued and to keep that updated. Um, I heard that the city has applied for the community rating system, the CRS program, um, and that's a good step that we could want to add that into the update of the, of the plan as well. Um, so, and then as part of the plan, um, Bob Eichenberg and myself are trying to meet with this, um, all of the cities and villages to get an update on um, what's been accomplished as far as this, um, the objectives and activities and tax, tasks. So to meet with uh, maybe public works, uh, the service directors, um, maybe perhaps the mayor, to find out where we're at and where we need to go as far as the plan objectives. And I think that that's pretty much where we're at right now. Um, and I'd, I'd like uh, members of the council to consider what um, what's at risk um, for Athens County? What are the hazards that may have happened? And if anything comes to mind, to please um, let us know so that we can make sure that we have that updated in our plan. Um, so I think that's... Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Go I ahead. just wanted to say that the biggest change that's occurring here is to have one consolidated plan. In the past, we had the city of Athens, we had the city of Nelsonville, Bainesville. the village, village of Amesville had their own, and then the other villages were combined. And since we do all work together, we have many mutual aid efforts out there that, it, um, that this is the focus now is to bring it all in. And of course, there'll be specifics related to each you know, area, too. Good to know. Yeah, so I have the, the old Athens plan here from it was last revised in October of 2005. So this will not be continued. It will be rolled into the county, um, to the county plan. Correct. It'll be a multi-jurisdictional plan yeah. um, rather than individual. So that, um, Makes more sense that way. Right. And this, the village of Amesville had updated, had been the first to put in their plan in 2004. And that's why we have the deadline that we do. Okay. Um, so we're helping to all be on the same page now, on the same timeline. Um, are you? Is there a mapping component to this? A GIS mapping component? Yes, we're we're hoping to work with, or we are working with GIS to have. Um, we want. We would like to have the structures in the floodplain identified in the mapping process. Are there going to be other risks identified, like lead, slip, like slip, slip slope, yeah, yeah, slope. Yeah. Um, also, not so much in the city of Athens, but there are some abandoned mine sites that mm -hmm. will. Um, tribute to subsidence and um, so we'd like to identify all of those sites as well I believe in the comprehensive plan efforts through the county they did do a lot of that mapping I, um, mm -hmm. I believe now it just needs to be updated to make sure we have accurate data and and we we've, we've passed new floodplain regulations right. within the past seven months mm -hmm. so and we are waiting for our CRS um, certification so so, you know, um, Councilmember Fault, today we were informed by uh, Paul Logue Planner that he spoke with FEMA and that in order to obtain the CRS rating, we're going to have another community assistance visit. So that okay. has to occur because it hasn't occurred within 12 months. Okay. So we're anticipating. Okay. <laughs> Three, just basic background information. It's my own needing to educate myself, but um, and you may have mentioned the expected completion date for the study, for the plan. Yep. Well, yeah. we're hoping to have a final draft um, in place by November okay. um, so that it can go out to FEMA and be adopted in January. And we'd like to give some cushion um, so that they can get back to us and we can make any changes that are required before the date is up. But the date will be January 2011 mm -hmm. that we would need to have it completed by. And are we planning to list this survey questionnaire on our 
Web City? Web City. It's out electronically right now. It's been out for about a month, maybe two months. Okay. Um, I filled it out through email, and it, I think. I think Chris is asking if there, we should put a link up on our website. Oh, website, website. On the city <laughs> website to encourage people. And help people. We can do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. That'd be great. Okay. It's currently on the Athens um, Regional Planning Commission website. Okay. <coughs> as well as copies, uh, links to the other plans that are out there within the county. And there's regular meetings. Paul Oak's involved in it. I'm involved in it. Paul is as well. Is, is this something, once it's complete, that each town will have to approve individually? Uh, so so we'll see it before council? Mm -hmm. or, okay. Yes, you'd be the governing body that would adopt. Okay, great. So we'll look forward to seeing that uh, after the summer, I suppose, the yeah. final form of it. How about your surveys? And fill, and fill your surveys out. Yeah, we have 55. <laughs> um, Believe it. Is, is there anything else on the natural hazard mitigation? All right, well, thank you so much for coming and, and for the important work that you do on this. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next on my agenda is an issue that didn't quite fit with any specific committee, so um, I decided to take it on and discuss it under environment tonight. And this is the city's non-discrimination policy. Um, we have legislation that covers uh, discrimination and prohibits it um, for, for a number of reasons, but it's not quite as complete as it can be. Um, so I, I met with a committee of Athens city residents about a week ago uh, to discuss uh, small things we can do to strengthen the city's non-discrimination policy. And this covers, it basically covers employment, housing, um, property sales, um, and property sales, hotel, uh, hotel accommodations. And really this is to get our city legislation in line with the values of, of Athens residents. We have a few uh, people here. I'm not sure if uh, any of them would like to speak to this tonight. Um, but if you would, you're more than welcome to sit at the table here uh, or stand at the podium, whatever you prefer. And just the podium to, really works better for the camera and the television, if you would. So please just introduce yourself. Um, and All right, my name is David Nichols, and I am a graduate student at Ohio University. I'm also a member of the LGBTA, which stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and <coughs> Ally Committee to Move Athens Forward. And one of the issues that um, we wanted to discuss, or the issue that we wanted to discuss with City Council this evening was updating the non-discrimination policy. And we have brought information along, so. Hand out. Pass them around. Pass them around. And I'll just go ahead and read this, and it's uh, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Allies Committee to Move Athens Forward, which is comprised of city, uh, citizens of the City of Athens, Ohio University, and Athens County, are asking that the phrase gender identity or expression be added to the following city ordinances. 3.07.62, which is unlawful discriminatory practices, 3.07.63, posting of notices, 3.07.65, purpose of the Community Relations Commission. We further ask that the following definition be added to City Ordinance 3.07.61, Community Relations Committee. Gender identity or expression means having or being perceived as having a gender identity, expression, appearance, or behavior, whether or not that gender identity, expression, appearance, or behavior is different from that traditionally associated with the sex assigned to that individual at birth. The city of Athens is a cornucopia of diversity, and the city has proven its willingness and commitment to embrace this diversity. Athens City Council added sexual orientation to the above mentioned policies long before many other cities in the state of Ohio. While that was much while that was more sorry, while that was more much appreciated, it did not cover 
the transgender and gender variant members of the LGBT community. We are asking you to continue to set the standard of being, a pro, of being proactive in creating a welcoming community by adding the phrase gender identity or expression to the above mentioned policies. We are confident that as the elected leaders, you understand the importance of this action that ensures equality, inclusion, and protection for all citizens and visitors of this diverse community. By adding gender identity or expression, Athens would be joining the likes of Akron, Bowling Green, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, Oxford, Toledo, and Yellow Springs. It is our hope that additional cities around the state will see the progressive nature of Athens and take measures to institute the same protections in their cities. Members of the LGBTA Committee to Move Athens Forward are willing to provide any assistance to City Council to help with this and any other actions that moves Athens forward in terms of equality for LGBT and other minority people. We look forward to, seeing, to seeking additional ways to make Athens more welcoming in the future. We appreciate your consideration and hope you will take swift action on this request. Also, what we have done is um, one of the organizations that is assisting us, which is Trans Ohio, uh, their legal representative has gone through and rewarded the current ordinances so you can see what it would look like with the addition of gender identity or expression and the definition in each specific ordinance. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think fundamentally this is about making sure that everyone in the city is treated fairly and equally um, no matter who they are. And it's, it's definitely, um, I think this is definitely something that, that we should take up. Mickey, would you care to? Well, I, I guess the only thing that I would add is that a, f a few years ago, Equality Ohio was here, and they're actually uh, represented here again tonight, as well as Trans Ohio and the P Flag, uh, local P Flag chapter. Uh, and it took many years to get sexual orientation added to, to the, this uh, particular ordinance. And over the course of the time from starting that process to when it finally was approved, gender identity and expression came along as well. And, and we, we start to understand more, more about the needs of the entire LGBT, making sure we include T, community. So really what this would do is um, follow up the good work that council did um, not all that long ago and, and bring it up to date and make it more inclusive. Uh, do we, are there any comments or questions? I have a question. Oh. Would you be adding gender identity or, and, or expression and keeping sexual orientation? Yes, okay. yes, you would. Um, they, they're actually two separate things. Each, uh, each person, quite honestly, has a sexual orientation and the gender identity or expression, so that they are, they are separate. And often they get confused because we, we talk about the LGBT community as one large community, but there's a couple different issues going on. But many of them have to do with gender and gender presentation and perceptions of that. And that's why the protections are needed. Um, if I remember, you're still part of the Community Relations Commission? I or am not. I was uh, the chair of that for a while and on it okay. for a while, but, but not no longer on it. Have you passed this by them and looked at it? Or I know that um, uh, John Schmeeding has, has um, followed up via email, but we've not, okay. we've not had uh, long discussions. To me, it's, um, it's um, something that just really makes sense to do. So mm -hmm. okay. we thought we'd start here. That sounds good. Great. Um, any other comments? Anyone else wishing to speak? Oh, the. I was here in 97 as were you mayor when we passed this and uh, people were lined up from there out the door to speak to it. It'll be interesting to see what happens this time around. I don't anticipate having what we did then. Uh, we had we can organize that if you'd like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the other side, Mickey, that had the wow. It was ministers yes. from Galilee. Oh, the original. Yeah, okay, yes. It was ministers from uh, Albany. It was uh, it, it, kind of interesting. I had a file on it that I stumbled into probably about six months ago, and I was leafing through it with all the hell and damnation that was going to come down on the city of Athens for passing... Uh, equal uh, rights for sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was really funny. I'd almost like to bring it out and wave it in the faces of a few of the people <laughs> that uh, starred here uh, that night. In fact, our good mayor and 
political ally was not supportive. As I remember, you said it was not discussed in the campaign, so should not be dealt with without being uh, discussed in a prior campaign, if you remember. No, I don't remember. <laughs> Quite possible. I have the clippings. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, when we did it back then, the only town on that list, I believe, was Yellow Springs. I'm kind of disappointed to see that there are that many people uh, that many different cities that are more progressive than Athens. I think we are getting more conservative all the time here. But be all that as it may, it'll be a fun debate to watch. Don't expect not to have opposition. Uh, not to, uh, uh, let's see, what was the one thing? We had a judge that on this issue when uh, someone uh, that was very assistive to the Democratic Party that was probably the first gen transgendered person I ever met, uh, was going through the process and she applied for her name change. Once the judge found out why the name was changing, he absolutely refused to do it. So it's, it's interesting. We'll yes. see what happens. It's, it's tough. And if folks would need more information, though, there are um, representatives from Trans Ohio here who could uh, definitely talk to you about that. And we've got um, email addresses on this copy, and we'll give this to the clerk um, so that you'll have that to pass on forward on to everyone. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks for the historical perspective on the previous yeah, I'm work done. Providing on more and more historical perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, but feel free to get. Uh, feedback to me, um, to City Council, and this will be discussed again shortly. So. Okay. Shall we? Uh, do you think that we should have some folks here at the next meeting? Um, we'll see what kind of feedback I get, and okay. um, I'll be in touch. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, last item on my agenda is uh, miscellaneous. Um, I don't have anything under miscellaneous tonight. Does anyone else have anything that needs to be addressed? Okay. On my community is adjourned. Jim, do you want to go next move back? Door? Yeah. Um, Kathy has auditor. We we skipped uh, finance and personnel because we had several miscellaneous issues. Uh, some of which you, I, I was hoping you would bring forward. Uh, one of the ones we wanted to talk about was. Um, we, I um, mean, the uh, recreation community center, recreation slash community center um, area. We have two directors, co-directors maybe, and one uh, director was set to be paid from the recreation fund. One was set to be paid from the community center fund. It appears as though both of them are currently being paid out of recreation. Actually, um, they were both budgeted in one fund, okay. but the one is being paid out of the correct fund. But the money wasn't put in the budget, okay. so they're going to run short at the end of the year if we don't appropriate the money, which is there to appropriate. Okay, um, and, and the fund in which it needs to be appropriated is, is recreation, recreation 270. Okay, um, and if you look at the most recent um, uh, unappropriate balance fund sheet that you have, you'll see that there's plenty of money to be um, appropriated in that fund. It just hasn't been appropriated in the correct uh, area. So we just, that's one of those things we need to take care of uh, next week. This is not uh, something that we need to suspend and, and deal with immediately, but it is something we, the auditor's office wants to get cleared up, obviously, before the end of the year. And we have two other uh, personnel Please. appropriations. Um, one would be actually in council in the general fund, 25000 I don't believe the interns, part-time people were budgeted originally. Um, and then in the internal service fund, which pays for mechanics and the IT person, um, it looks like we need about 15000 in there. Um, so those three. We're just halfway through the year looking at the personnel and where we are and whether we got everything in there that we needed or not. So. City Council currently does not have classical intern mm -hmm. positions, but we do have several of these people who work with us every um, week um, in, the, in the production area are classed as interns, and so that 
pay that uh, money needs to be uh, put into the fund to allow them to be paid. Um, you see them behind cameras and occasionally walking around yeah. in there. Um, and doing a heck of a job, as they say. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, the um, IT person, um, we know Ron Forrest um, deals with a host of issues with regards to computers and, and all electronic stuff in the city. And um, that particular fund also needs some additional money appropriated. And Audit, am I correct that none of these need suspension? Correct. At least for speed. Okay. We will bring those forward um, on Monday, though. Any questions about those three miscellaneous? They're all personnel related. On the safety services? On the safety services? No, wait a second. Oh, we got oh, unless we have something else to bring up. Oh, 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 okay. Sorry. <laughs> miscellaneous. We will, we'll I, can I do one more and then? Go ahead. Apologize. Okay. Um, I brought this up at our meeting last week, and uh, the Finance Committee said go ahead, but I just wanted to let everybody know that um, I would be like to bring forth a, a resolution, have Council bring forth a resolution. Um, granting me authority to apply for a P card or purchasing card through Chase Bank. Um, I know some of you are familiar with these. They issue them at, at the university as part of your budget, and you have a, a money limit on there. Uh, as far as the city goes, we won't be handing out P cards to people. We would have one in my office uh, to be used for major purchases and even actually paying our workers' comp bill, although we already have paid that for this year because the sooner we pay, the more discount we get. But we um, will get money for uh, uh, using that. And I know that one other agency that I'm um, on the board for recently got several, and they are getting um, uh, 10000 no, yeah, $150 for every $10,000 they spend or something like that. I guess I don't even remember anymore. But um, it just really, it's kind of a win-win situation. We're going to be spending the money anyway, and so we will get money back from Chase Bank if we do this. So I have a sample resolution. I don't know if anybody gave it to you yet. Or, Kathy, okay, is I'll the give state that. auditor okay with this? Pardon? The state auditor is fine with this, or the, you know. Attorney uh, General? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> no, our auditors. There is no problem with this yeah, at all? No, no. <laughs> like I said, they're pretty widespread at the university level. Um, other nonprofit agencies use them, and it's, um, I don't know. It's like a debit card. It, it, it's one thing about this, it makes part of the transaction stream we have uh, paperless. Um, and I'm aware the university has a P card system, but they've reined it in. The idea we only have one is much more reassuring than um, <coughs> the university where occasionally they put too many out, and you have a whole series of problems with that. But the idea that really is this enables us to actually, you know, move money around quicker in one sense without going through the uh, paperwork. This discussion was actually begun when it was, when we got our first uh, statement regarding um, um, workers' comp. Workers comp. Yeah. And as the auditor suggested, the sooner we pay that, the more discount we get on that. Luckily, we had the funds to pay that now, but we might not always be in that position, so this P card would allow us to to pay and get those discounts, which are also available in other large purchases. So um, it would be something held very close in the auditor's office. Um, and uh, how will we account for the benefit? I mean, let's the money that accumulates, how will that be? Well, accumulated? my thought is, say, one of the things I'm looking at us using it for vehicle purchases, whatever department purchases that vehicle out of their funds would get the rebate or whatever you want to call it back. If it's used for other things besides workers' comp. Yeah. If you're asking a question, where would the, the refund come through for workers' comp? I guess it would be divided up. Well, I'm, oh, that would be, I'm yeah. saying, you know. For workers' comp, that would be, we have that percentage all figured out anyway. And so, yeah, it would go back into whatever department's paid for whatever we used it for. Okay. Is there a, um, this isn't like a credit card where there's a no. annual. We're not allowed to do that. Nothing. Right. That's what I thought. Nothing. So if you pay something ahead of time, if the money's not there, how do we deal with it? Well, we can't. The, the P card is, the money is on there. We have to 
put the money on there. So it's, it's like, like a, a debit card. gift card kind of thing. Okay. The, the money is there. Um, so say we're going to purchase a vehicle, council appropriates the money, it's in the fund, we put the money on the card and then we use it. To so instead pay. of using a purchase order, you would just use the P card? Yeah, but we would have that paper trail also. Okay. Nothing is being eliminated. No, paper trail no. Wise. no. It would we, actually be backed up by the P card paper trail. Mm -hmm. I mean, I assume that there's also a paper trail with the P card. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's like getting a, a gift card to pay for something. You go to the bank or you get a gift card and use that to pay for something instead of just writing a check or, um, and then, like I said, we get money back. It's just a way for the city to make some money on all the money we spend is the way I look at it. Okay. This is a resolution that will come before council. And we'll discuss it more and sure. make it just Right, simple. that, yeah. Um, it's, have a sample resolution to give Debbie. And maybe when she um, <laughs> edits it, as she usually has to do, <laughs> for our purposes, you could send it out to everybody and everybody could, you know, I think that would be a good idea. Okay. The sample one is just the one put out by the bank, which everybody uses, I guess. Okay, so look so for that in your email. Okay. So I think sure. that's... It for me. Okay, service safety director. I need money. Um, <laughs> in 2008, we closed out a FEMA funded uh, grant that was, I'm sorry, ARC funded grant from Appalachian Regional Commission that was for the Columbus Road pump station out there on Columbus Road. Um, closed it out. We've received notice that because we did not meet our, uh, at the time, we anticipated $96,000 in our local share costs. They've recalculated the figures, 72% uh, from ARC. The rest has got to be the city. Uh, bottom line, $8,488 is what they want returned from the project. Mind you, this was a $337,000 project, um, but that's how fast those wheels turn. Uh, um, I would need that as an additional appropriation, and that would have to come out of the water fund. Um, Jeff Hill. Those uh, bids were opened, and we're a little short in money. We're asked, oh, you're going to do that one, right, Chris? Or should I? <laughs> you, you, can, you can go ahead and explain it now. Um, I think you have the better figures on that. Okay. So, um, Nature Works, I'm working with Kathy through this. Um, the paving cost, that bid was open, it comes in at 37728 if we have the budgeted 40000 Rich is indicating he may need up to 10000 additional. So this would also come from the recreational fund in order to complete that project. That's where they're moving and putting in a real roller hockey and also re-asphalting the ba basketball courts. And the biggest thing is the um, canoe access ramp. Again, this was started back in 2008. Monies were appropriated in 2009. And here in, I am in 2010, and I need full authorization for the project, including appropriation. Is that summing up, Debbie? That's okay. it. That one I would like an emergency clause on. Emergency. We're supposed to complete that. Uh, the, what are we uh, talking about? 28000 And again, that would be a recreational capital item. I, Kathy is good, and I, we're gonna, she's going to look at this real closely and come back with some hard figures, but uh, I would ask and request that we get the emergency suspension clauses and all that. All the categories you talked about, there's ample money in them. Mm -hmm. The um, ramp? Yes. Uh, it was talked about in 2008, but it was never... Money was appropriated, but in never 2009, used. In 2009, but they had a very long, involved environmental yeah. assessment. So the money was, and then because uh, now it's 2010. Okay. There was no project member uh, tied to it at the time. Okay. Um, there is now. Yeah. Okay. Taken care of. We were authorized to go after the grant to uh, 03108. Uh, we appropriated the money in, uh, oh, 0, oh, wait a second. 03108 was when we went for the grant. The deadline was April 1st, 2008. We actually appropriated 27000 at the time at zero at uh, in 09, January of 09. 
first the first ordinance of that year, and then it just uh, took a long time. I guess Army Corps of Engineers had to be involved. Army Corps of Engineers had to be involved, and just it's been going quite some time. It'll be a masterpiece, I'm sure. <laughs> there is a grant involved. Yes. Or do you remember how much? I think we 27 at that time, where it was 28 is what we're requesting. It's RMAC. It's a, re, a fully reimbursable. It's, it's actually 100%. Yeah. But until you expend it, and at this pace and closing it out by the end of the year, it, we may not receive the reimbursement until next year. So. And then the only last thing I had was I had talked about the renewal of the College Street lot, as it were, and you had asked for me to request. I have made that inquiry. What I've gotten back from Attorney Malika is what percentage would the city seeking and he's willing to ask but I I did crunch some numbers um, it costs us about ten thousand dollars sometimes a little less uh, to operate that but then we also if you were to factor in the value of the parking spaces pretty much break even um, concept there um, but I am running out of time so I, I will see what he comes back with but then I will also need whatever clause that is because it expires at the end of July, and we won't get um, the 30 days. We'll get the three readings in. Thanks for looking at that. Okay. okay. A lot of miscellaneous, more than I even knew. Or are we done with your miscellaneous, Ms. Mosley's We are up until transportation comes on board. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very We're not done with our money needs. <laughs> Put on to Safety right Services right Committee. Right. Member Coon. Thank you. Rudy Leatherman here with us tonight. He is a combustion analysis expert. He currently is employed uh, by COAD, but he is a former HVAC contractor. Um, it is his belief that UL carbon monoxide detectors, that their threshold per parts per million is too low and he is not a fan of theirs. And he is going to give us a demonstration tonight. And by the way, he has indicated that he has no financial investment in the company. <laughs> Other than I purchased their products myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's my understanding that you all are considering uh, carbon monoxide alarm warnings for rentals in town. And I'm just assuming that it will be, you will require a UL approved carbon monoxide alarm. I would suggest that maybe that would be the minimum, and that if someone wanted to put in a carbon monoxide alarm that exceeded the minimum requirements, that that be allowable. It's pretty simple. And I've got a little demonstration. I've actually done this all over the country. <laughs> in fact, my boys and I were in Austin, Texas about a month ago. So it's sort of interesting to be in my own backyard doing it. By the way, one of the issues I have with this, uh, Sherry brought in her carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, one of which she, she suspects is about 10 years old. Um, I have personal experience with this because Consumer Reports rated this one number one. I purchased it for my own. That's the one I own. Sir, could we ask you to try to stay close to the microphone oh, sure. so okay, everybody sure. right there, move yeah. my box? Yeah. Land can okay. hear you. Um, when the, the company that I worked for most recently, a company called Bacharach Incorporated, uh, they make combustion analyzers and carbon monoxide test instruments for the HVAC market. I was probably one of the very first, in fact, I'm sure I was one of the very first car, uh, contractors in the Athens area to do combustion carbon monoxide testing starting in about 1986-87. This one was rated number one. Okay. One of the issues I have, and that has changed in the last revision, but one of the issues I have with a UL approved carbon monoxide alarm is that they do not require any end of sensor life uh, indication in the instrument. This one is 10 years old. I can guarantee you uh, it does not work. Okay, but if I hit the test button, it'll uh, all you all required at this moment with the one you've got also, Mr. Baez, is that is that it not it didn't require that it test the sensor. It just required that it tested the buzzer. I'm going to ask maybe that you should be by the podium since you like to stand up. So, okay. okay. I kind of need to. But he's been trying to get a beat on you for the last <laughs> dialogue, then. I realize you were very, pretty far away from the mic. Okay. okay. I'll just return to The thing is, uh, as a moving detector system. <laughs> Well, when I'm doing presentations, I'm used to moving around. So I'm okay, so what I've got is a tank of 100 ppm CO. Okay, uh, we use these to calibrate test instruments. And what I'm going to do is I've got three 
carbon monoxide alarms that, if you look closely, they're virtually identical. The only difference is these two are, have a UL sticker on the back. Um, this one, which you can see, <laughs> looks identical except for the name, does not have a UL sticker on the back. This one cannot be UL approved. This is the only one I would allow in my own home. I have two of them in my own home. Okay. Um, I'm going to blow these up with 100 ppm CO. How long, if it was in your home, how long would you want it to wait before it went on? Not long. <laughs> <laughs> hour, hour and a half. I've done this thousands of times. <laughs> okay, you bear with me for a second. This one also has a digital display on it, but UL does not require any degree of accuracy in digital displays. And uh, I read a report one time on the performance and reliability of carbon monoxide alarms, and it said that the displays uh, seemingly produce random numbers. <laughs> that was the comment in the report. Well, this, so this one here, you keep an eye on that one. Let me know if it ever does anything. We don't pay too close to that. Okay. Okay. And we put Sherry's in that Ziploc bag and blew it up, what, at about 10 till 7 or so. And it hasn't uh, done anything. Um, this one I've actually never been able to get to go off. The one nice thing about the newer CO alarms, or some CO alarms, is that they do have a uh, provision in it. When you put the battery in it, that five years after you install that battery, it's going to start blinking and say end of sensor life or whatever. Um, that is something I would uh, would think would be a good idea to include in uh, any sort of uh, CO alarm ordinance that you put in. Really start going in the bag. <laughs> okay. I mean, this, is, this just amazes me every time I do it. It is going in the bag. <laughs> yeah, it is going in the bag. Don't try this at home. <laughs> I'm a trained professional. Someone open a window. That's ironic because in about 1989 or so, I got a call to come and visit the boiler room here in this building. Um, I can't remember. I was trying to think what the <coughs> city safety service director's name was at that time. Uh, but there was a serious CO problem in the basement of this building, and it was sort of interesting because what we finally ended up figuring out was it wasn't coming from the boilers. It was coming from the fresh air intake every time a truck parked out in the <laughs> alleyway. Automobile exhaust, 60% of the time that uh, carbon monoxide alarms go off, it's due to automobile, automobile exhaust. Okay, So I would suggest that you consider uh, that homes in town, if they're uh, if they have an attached garage, even if it's on an all electric home, that it uh, have a CO alarm. Now, this is the one that I would recommend. This is the one that's uh, okay. And already, it wasn't quick enough. <laughs> already, there's a ring in the display. Okay. Does it go off? Okay. It'll go off here. Uh -huh. okay. So, what was the parts per million? It said 34 on it. 34. And now it's up to 50. Whoa. Okay, and you can see that these are virtually identical alarms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, all the it's got the same parts and components in it. The difference is the software, the way this one's been programmed. Okay, the other thing I like about this one that would be an advantage to you all is when I hit the test reset button, it tells me the highest reading since I cleared it last. Okay, it tells me how many days, hours, and minutes ago that reading occurred, and the duration of days, hours, and minutes. So. If an emergency responder came up and hit the button, uh, it would tell them when it went off. Basically, that, that, that was when somebody was out in the garage, the car running, something like that. Okay. And the reason that this one went off so quick and those still haven't is that in order to be UO approved below 30 parts per million, they, they're prohibited from ever going off. Or display, they can't do anything below 30 parts per million. And that, the regulation is a little tricky. It reads it had under 30 parts per million. It has to wait at least 30 days. Well, I always assumed that on day 31 it would start going off. No, it doesn't require that it goes off on day 31. It just requires that it wait at least 30 days. Okay, so the manufacturers typically make them so they never go off or display below 30 parts per million. Okay. Then between 30 and 70 parts per million, they're allowed to display, but the UL doesn't require any degree of accuracy in the displays. So, yeah, I'm not sure that that's that big a deal. Um, but they're prohibited from ever alarming. Okay. Um, so that, that's basically <laughs> the point I'm trying to get across. And all the components in all of these alarms are UL approved. It's just those two are UL listed. 
because they're you know UL UL listing is kind of like the the manufacturer to get together and suggest what they how their equipment ought to perform, um, and they come up with this listing. So again, I would argue that, that exceeding the UL listing um, is something that would be considered. And if you look right on the box of this particular alarm, it says warning: individuals with medical problems may consider using warning devices which provide audible and visual signals for carbon monoxide concentrations under 30 parts per million. So right on the box of this manufacturers says <laughs> if you have medical problems, and some of them even say if, if, if you've got uh, elderly or young children in the home, you should um, get a seal along the head that will display under 30 parts per million. And this one also, here's where it says end of life signal will be activated after five years of service for DC models. Okay. The other issue with, that I have with these type of alarms is where are you going to put it? Yeah. <laughs> Down there. Down there. Carbon monoxide is lighter than air. Okay, so it's probably not going to get there. Both of these alarms, my experience with this one was that it's 120 volts uh, with a 9 volt battery backup. Uh, the battery will last about 8 hours. So, in the event of a power outage, you know, it's, it's going to last for about 8 hours, is my experience. Okay. Um, the other issue that you need to consider, and I'd be more than happy to work with anybody on this, there are three types of uh, sensors that uh, manufacturers are using these, uh, at, these uh, detectors. I would recommend an electrochemical sensor. Those are the most accurate. The company that I work for um, made test instruments, and I brought one tonight. Okay, this is the carbon the full combustion analyzer that the company I work for made. Um, and the interesting thing is, when I first got to thinking about the UL approval stuff, I looked on the back of this. You would think, would this have to be UL approved? <laughs> <laughs> you, you would think so. It's not. You know, so I don't really, you know, I don't quite understand uh, what the concern about that is. But everybody, everybody that requires that uh, CO alarms be put in, they automatically default to the, the UL approved. But that's what everybody's used to think of. So, you know, when I first, uh, the co this company I worked for was approached by the gentleman that owns the CO experts alarms, and there is another low-level alarm that's out on the market. Uh, this one uh, I, I support uh, personally because it's made in America. <laughs> in fact, it's made in Ohio now. They make them up in Metro, Ohio. And they're more expensive than, uh, um, than most CFUL proof CO alarms, which are primarily made offshore. Um, but I think that uh, you know, they shouldn't be prohibited in, you know, in, this, in this particular situation. And Ohio, you, know, you, you all could sort of set a precedent here. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. Um, is there a way to see, um, is there a list of UL approved components out there? I mean, if it's no. not UL approved, well, then... Well, uh, I, I guess when I think about it, I'm not sure what the issue is with regards to UL approval. Yeah, Doesn't it cost a, money to get things UL yeah, approved? Yeah, yeah, and this is a full combustion analyzer that is tremendously more accurate than any of these uh, um, sensors. and. There's no UL approval required for this type of instrumentation. I'm not sure, you know, my understanding is that UL has committees that get together and decide on sort of minimum performance standards, and that's how these uh, uh, regulations have come up. And my own personal opinion is that we're, we're, we're partially responsible for this as consumers, because what do we look for in a product? <laughs> right. I mean, these are much more expensive. My guess would be, that if these were allowed in the city of Athens, very few uh, landlords would be would put them in. Although I do know one landlord that bought a, a case of them or something because he had a situation where he had some students get poisoned. Do you know how expensive they are? Oh, they list for about two hundred bucks, something like that. Oh, they're two hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that's the list price, you know. And and he sells them direct. And this fellow, fellow named George Kerr, if you wanted to go online. Because uh, I didn't come up with this, uh, this information, I've learned this over the years. But coexperts.com is the website. There's a lot of information on the website. Uh, man, if you wanted to talk to George, uh, give him a call. <laughs> Just get yourself a cup of coffee because <laughs> you're going to be on the phone with him for a while. <laughs> and he could explain. He could go in. He was on the committee. Um, he was involved with a company called Aim Safety. He's an engineer that. Uh, uh, you used to make uh, another low-level alarm that the company went out of business. So, yeah. Could you come up with a list of things that you would look for? Sure. 
just to put in for our discussion. Sure, I'd be happy to. Sure. Here. I would point out that this is on the third reading next week. Yes. And that is. you do have two sections in there that say you shall be email list. Yes, we do. You're thinking about it, maybe. So, well, I was I was going to ask council what they would like to do. Would we like to perhaps put this on hold for a while, table it for a little while, and okay. discuss it at another committee meeting, and not have our mm -hmm. third reading? Unless you can come up with the requirements. I mean, was Before. trying to mentally think, how do you write the legislation to incorporate the things that you're Well, a lot of, like the state of Washington, for example. The state of Washington, for example, uh, what they came up with was it just says uh, uh, meets or exceeds uh, the UL requirements. Okay. So the UL could be our minimum. Exactly. exactly. That, that's what it's. That's what it's designed to be. Is the minimum standard. It would. But <laughs> I get frustrated because it would be like me telling my daughter who's going to OU, you got to get a C. You can't get an A or a B. <laughs> you got to get a C. <laughs> you know. So this could be our minimum, yeah. but it wouldn't be prohibited to have something better. Yeah. But how? The one that's not UL listed, how do we know that it's better? I mean, how is it? Just <laughs> right, but. I don't know that we can write the legislation yeah. to meet what we've learned right. tonight right. is what I'm yeah. struggling right. with here. I mean, is there a, a listing of. Not um, that I'm aware of. Um, yeah. You know, I would suggest. That's, that's the concern. Is sure, that, I understand. I mean, if you oh, have a UL listed minimum, then that wouldn't qualify at all because it's not UL listed at all. Because it exceeds the minimum standards. You start started reading out at 17 if it was UL approved. It but is there something that says that it exceeds? Is there a certification process these go through? Or? Not any more than any of the rest of them. I mean, UL listed, all that means is that it meets min these minimum standards that the manufacturers have gotten together with UL. Right and come up with. But apart from us as a city testing each individual brand, I mean, that's why the UL is kind of used is because we don't, and the, so we don't have the to one do that. that is better is it's for us to say, well, this one is better. Um, Oh, it's not. There's it's, nothing that says that it's if it's not certified. Do you understand well, what I'm I, I'm not, these aren't. None of these are certified. They're listed, which just means that they meet those UL standards. They, that they perform like UL says they will, which means they won't but, display or alarm. Right, below but what 30. keeps something that's not listed by UL because they haven't gone through that process being crummier? Um. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> if we require, you know, it's. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm I, I think what we would need to re say, here's the minimum UL, which which warns at 30 parts per million, um, that is a minimum standard. And then, then you could go m more aggressively if you installed something that alarmed at 10 parts per million. Um, so I, I think you need to write the legislation with regards to the parts per the million. Particular, the, yeah, the, the standards, level of the parts per million. The, yeah. the level of, of C <coughs> that you want to warn against, mm -hmm. rather than recommending a certain. Right. But if, if each individual um, brand is not certified to some degree, you only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's true. So. I mean, how do we know that beyond t you testing this particular brand? Mm -hmm. Does it say on its package what the minimum? Um, it's a, it says in the in the instruction manual. It says, okay. yeah. The range, you mean? The range, the range. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not too sure. We don't write it as well as we can, and then really encourage every student to own their own that they put in their own bedroom. <laughs> that uh, you know what. I think if I was uh, sending a kid away to college this week. I think the going away gift I'd send them with would be yep. a really good card on the long side. That's, that's what I did. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've been leaving in the car while I was running. No, but I think any, any home that uh, um, has 
uh, in an attached garage, whether it's all electric or not. Um, any home that uh, has a, a, a gas-fired or oil-fired piece of heating equipment that's not direct vent, which means it basically means it's vented with plastic pipe. Basically, it has to be a high-efficiency unit. If it has metal pipe, metal vent pipe on it, uh, then I think a CO alarm needs to be installed. Um, if it's got a gas range. Um, that's another time when a CO alarm needs to be installed. Gas ranges are, are just horrible. You know, uh, uh, according to the AGA, a vented appliance is allowed up to 400 ppm CO, whereas a gas range is allowed up to, you'd think it would be, what, lower? <laughs> it's allowed up to 800 parts per million CO. And that standard was come up with in 1927, and we're still using it today. I guess that's why they say don't heat with your oven. Well, and don't put a CO alarm in the kitchen because... You know, it's going to go off all the time. It'll go off all the time. Yeah, and we, I've got a couple of rentals in town. We're switching them all over to high efficiency direct vent uh, heating equipment. We're putting electric hot water tanks in and electric stoves in. Just, you know, I'm that, I'm that concerned about it. And I've put these in all, in fact, they've been in for years because five years after you put the battery in, uh, they'll start beeping occasionally and it'll say end of sensor life in the display. And here in the past four or five months, <laughs> it must have been about five years ago we put them in. So. Well, this has nothing to do with rental properties, but you were showing me before the meeting the little detector that you wear oh, on yeah. your belt. If you Could you share that with us? No, it's an electrical electric, electric chemical is the proper term. Um, for people in the, for city workers, um, this is one, and I won't represent these in any way. We just happen to uh, run across one of these. Uh, they're about 150 bucks. They'll last for two years of continuous use. Um, and if I do a little bag trick on this one. These seem to be, and there's a, there's a number of these on the market. Um, but carbon monoxide, I mean, it's amazing, especially, I know there's a lot of people that are pretty, oh, they're not too worried about fumes from automobiles. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I've traveled around with uh, CO, with CO test instruments in my vehicle quite a bit. It's just a little personal alarm. Yeah, you can actually set it so that it'll alarm at, uh, it's got two alarm points. This one's set up for 25 and 50. And it's got a little, uh, it vibrates like a cell phone. It goes off. You all are concerned yeah. about it. I know here, several years ago, I can't remember how long ago it's been. It was I was the acting mayor. Oh, were you really? Okay. Yeah. And that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really, I'd like to see these on every city yeah. worker that would ever find themselves in any enclosed spaces. Or even um, garage. I mean, I'm amazed when I'm going down the highway and I get that whiff of uh, rich burning gas smell from the vehicle in front of me. You're 150, 200 BPM. It's not scary. Yeah, it is. But no. Oh, I mean, if you're interested, we can yeah, set up a special deal with the distributor over in Indiana. In Indiana. Um, but I think they're selling them. They list for about $200. And we've got a deal set up to you know, they'll sell them for the friends of Coma Ash. Hit it with a hammer. <laughs> and they've got a nice little clip on the back. Uh, so you clip it to your belt. Uh, they both want to be so you can fix it up We've just been very impressed with how quickly they're responding. Yeah. Get your attention. I think it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Hang that on the wall. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, you could. You could. Yeah. <laughs> the, the device you showed us tonight, the, uh -huh. the one that actually has the sensitive detection, mm -hmm. that's battery only? Uh, yes. So it's a yearly change? Well, no, it's actually, uh, the, uh, actually what a lot of CLR manufacturers are doing is coming out with uh, a 10 year lithium battery. Um, and since you've only got about five years for the sensor, the, the 10 year lithium battery should more than uh, uh, take care of the, of the life of that, of that uh, detector. Our fire chief is not a fan of lithium batteries. So, um, you mentioned that. Okay. So, um, well, then, yeah, then if you put a regular battery in it, you'd have to change it out every year. Yeah. Just like, well, the smoke alarms in the city are now. Now, are you all wanting to do this just for rentals, or is this for everybody? This is just for rentals. Okay, okay. I mean, a lot of places, uh, a lot of states, the state, state of New York, uh, um, has a CO alarm ordinance for every every you know every every house, um, and I think it would be definitely something to consider. Why are we not? 
to. Well, how do you enforce it? Um, I don't know that you can, but rental properties it's the are law. expected. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On rental properties, we can enforce it. On the others, we probably can't. But let's say it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is I mean, insurance helps to do. I mean, people get a reduction if they have CO2 and fire monitors. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Yeah, I actually would favor having an across the board requirement. But I, I think, you know, the first step, I think the most vulnerable properties are probably rentals because of the age of that housing stuff. Right. So I think you know, us taking that up now is probably the most important. Yeah, sure, sure. I understand. And I'll make this offer. I mean, I'm always looking for new slides to put in my presentations. Um, if you have any questions about your own heating systems, your own hot water tank furnace, uh, give me a call. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to come, come by if I can bring my camera. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Okay, for sure. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been very enlightening. <laughs> I'll pack up my boys. <laughs> and so we'll just sort of put our current ordinance on hold and we'll discuss it a little bit at the next safety committee meeting. What you can do is alter your language and um, move to amend. That would take it back to first reading. First reading, and, so we can have first reading. And just keep it going. Okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with considering it a living document, letting it change a couple of times along the way. At least we're not going to get slowed down. Okay. All right. Um, that's all I have. Is there any miscellaneous for the safety? That's all for the safety committee meeting. Transportation, Christine Paul. Oh, Christine Paul. Christine Nisley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. President. We have five agenda items tonight. Uh, <laughs> all called miscellaneous. <laughs> all called miscellaneous, but I'll detail them for you. Um, the first one is just a general announcement to let you know that Dump the Pump Day, a project that we've participated in for several years now, uh, that Dump the Pump Day is June 17th, and we're encouraging people on that day to use other methods of transportation that don't require gasoline uh, or, or to use mass transit. And I believe that the mayor has authorized, or the city has authorized, free bus fare on June 17th. That's this week? Yep. Thursday. Thursday. Think about it. Carpool or ride the bus or bicycle or walk to work. Item number two. Uh, well, the next four items have to do with some additional monies that are needed for various projects that we have taking place this year. The first one being our 2010 street improvements. Uh, we realize that the costs are greater and that we uh, need to appropriate $28,000 um, additional, excuse me, tw we have 20. The recreation fund, 270, only has $28,000 in appropriated funds. So what we need to do is increase this by $12,000. That's fund 270. So this would be amending ordinance 050-10. And we would need to suspend on that or uh, the amendment of that ordinance. The second one has to do with um, what Paula Horan Mosley mentioned earlier, which is the East Union Street Rehabilitation, which is the Jeff Hill project. And this was, uh, the original appropriation was $290,000, and that was appropriated in Ordinance 00210. And we need additional funds to cover the uh, cost of the construction and contingencies. The, uh, the project as it stands now to, has money awarded to it from state issue one, grant fund monies, water infrastructure, sewer infrastructure, street rehab, several street rehab accounts. And um, we're recommending an increase uh, to cover the contingency fees, an increase of $26,700. And this would be split among four accounts, water infrastructure, sewer infrastructure, street, uh, street rehab, two different, uh, and the street rehab, excuse me, street rehab funds. So I have the details of those actual fund account numbers um, and can provide those for you for the ordinance. And once again, this is um, amending an ordinance for which we have already appropriated money. 
and we would need to suspend on this uh, amendment. Next one is for. Chris, can I ask you one quick question? Sure. Uh, the first item you were talking about, you said the recreation fund. Part of our monies for the street rehab this year I'm were sorry. taken from recreation this funds. Is part of the we kind of um, didn't coordinate well tonight, but that was part of this nature works that we're working with um, the auditor on and locating how much money was placed in there. Okay. That's where the pavement pavement costs, the asphalt came in a lot. This is for the nature works for the asphalt and uh, basketball court and the. Uh, we talked about that earlier. When we were talking about the finance. But I thought I heard you say that there was only twenty eight thousand in the amount. That's been has that's only been appropriate. Has been appropriate. Got it. Got, so it, got, got it. Got it. Got it. Mike, okay. stumbling on the wording. Thank you. Okay. The next item is for the issue one grant and what we are needing to do is each year we authorize the city to be able to apply for issue one grant funds for special projects for us for <coughs> street rehabilitation and so this is part of our uh, an annual ordinance that we would like to submit to um, authorize the, uh, the mayor to submit that application this year. And as we've discussed previously, this year's funds for the Issue 1 grant will be um, focused on the improvements to North Court Street area that will take place. I think hopefully some of the work, at least initial inventory for that, that will take place this summer. And the last item has to do with the salt bin and needing an amendment for the legislation for this. Um, the original ordinance was 01610. And what's happened with um, the work on the salt bin is the ground so that there isn't runoff and leaching. And what's happened is, is that we realize that an additional, uh, or we're realizing now that some of the costs for things like two feet of clay that needs to be underneath this concrete uh, slab and, and the work that needs to be done to excavate for that and then also the placement of the clay is, is um, costing more money for us. Um, so this has been the vast majority of the costs. Um, or the additional costs. So what we need to do is increase the street appropriation um, by $50,000 to cover the additional costs for it. And as I said, this would then help us prevent leaching of the runoff in the groundwater. We need $50,000 in the water fund. We need an additional $100,000. I know that sounds like a major project. We have $150,000 that you appropriated. The original um, construction design for, uh, engineer estimate has come in at like 268. Mm -hmm. the, the actual structure is kind of prefab, but as she indicated, it's the actual excavation in order to protect the aquifer and the outline that's, that's going to be the higher cost. So 50,000 from street and 50,000 from water. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying that. Any you know, the, the money's there. Barely, but you know, Reno. things like the street yeah. funds when you get into the middle of what we're doing this summer, and uh, we almost always seem to have to tap into a little bit more right at the last minute, and there's not going to be a heck of a lot left. We understand, and that'll be related to staff. And, and, and I, I'm not complaining, I right. think you have to do it. Yeah. You can't get in the middle of what you're doing here and not complete it either, but uh, that's going to be tight later on. Yes, I think so. And realize the salt bin has been sitting there for quite a few years trying to get up and running and you, you spent some time studying the ground and apple for it. So, All you know. noble goals. Okay. And are there any other miscellaneous items for transportation? Oh, I can't think of any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just an announcement. It's not know. bad. We got our money Friday. So it's time to order the buses. Okay. Oh, right. Get the PO going. How about that PICO? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is that everything? That's it. Uh, that's every item on our agenda. In no other business, we stand adjourned.